Welcome everyone to our program today. I am Regina Hartfield and I am sitting in for Michelle Dingle as moderator for the fourth and final 2021 Black History Month speaker series sponsored by the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project. This program is available in closed caption. Our guest today is Dr. Karen Kasi, Chair Nishiroff. I'm sorry, <laughs> an award-winning writer and professor of history at Texas Southern University, where her research focuses on African-American women's intellectual history, African-American religion, and the African diaspora. Her topic today is remembering and re-remembering the Middle Passage, 100 Years of Fact and Fiction from Lillian Jones Horace's Five Generations Hence, published in 1916, to Sawandai Mustakim Slavery at Sea, published in 2016. A fourth generation Texan, Dr. Kasi is the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in the field of history from a Texas institution. She has studied, traveled, and conducted research in Western Europe, the Americas, Scandinavia, Eurasia, and off the coast of Africa. As well as her edited works, Recovering Five Generations Hence, The Life and Writing of Lillian Jones Horace, and Angie Brown, A Jim Crow Romance, Dr. Kasi has published numerous articles and book reviews. She has also been awarded research grants from many institutions, among them the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Texas Council for Humanities, the African Studies Association, Rice University, Duke University Special Collections, the University of Houston, and Texas Southern University, where she is also proudly celebrating 24 years of service. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> In addition, she has served as an expert for local and international media programs, including the History Channel. In terms of the African-American experience, the history of the Middle Passage has been omitted, often deliberately from the national narrative. And how to tell the story has also been a challenge. 
Our ancestors and our family often shielded us from horrific details. The perpetrators and their descendants removed themselves from liability and ignored the history. And what is left at best is a skimming of the truth. In today's presentation, Professor Kashi will explore how the Middle Passage and its effects are conveyed by several writers through scholarly research, storytelling, fiction, and fantasy projection. Addressing the importance of including our history in the American narrative, Kasi says, sometimes our answers come from people who, we, who are no longer here. We see parts of ourselves in them, and we imagine how we too can rise above circumstance to live our own remarkable lives. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Kasi. Thank you so much. I am so honored to have this opportunity to share with you. The title of my presentation, as she's mentioned, is Remembering and Remembering the Middle Passage, 100 Years of Fact and Fiction from Lillian Jones Horace, Five Generations Since, which was published in 1916 to Sawande Mustaqim's Slavery at Sea. Middle Passage ceremonies and port markers provide, by virtue of, of the organization's mission, it's committed to a ceremony, a ritual and spiritual affirmation of the middle passage and markers, tangible reminders of the transatlantic slave trade. This commitment to an ongoing concrete affirmation of the middle passage the extensive triangular trade of enslaved people of African descent and goods that endured for nearly 400 years. Over the course of that 400 year period and its aftermath, the Middle Passage sustained entire nations and their institutions, businesses, investors, and their families, educational institutions, and even places of worship at the dramatic and incalculable expense of the enslaved and their progeny. The African diaspora are those whom they were forced to leave behind. Remembering helps us remember, that is to put things back together. In all of the major faith traditions, remembering lies at the very foundation of sustaining and maintaining faith and hope for the future. Memorizing the tenets of the faith is key. In African cultures, the importance of remembering is affirmed through the role of the African griot, and in the African diaspora, through the oral tradition. Remembering helps us maintain ties to relatives, to communities, cultures, and nations. Our bodies themselves are programmed to remember. Our DNA helps us know scientifically where those who share our genetic imprint are geographically situated. The genetic tale of the, of the Middle Passage is imprinted in our very DNA. We see it when we look at ourselves in the mirror and when our children are born with features that emerge from distant relatives ever present. What to do with these memories? This ongoing human effort to remember the need to know our origins attracts both those who are interested in fact and those who are interested in using those facts to fuel the imagination. That space where we can create new possibilities, where we can take a flight of fancy from a reality that is sometimes too bleak to bear. Given the length of the slave trade, nearly 400 years, and the ongoing efforts of, to repair and restore so much of what was broken, or to create new realities out of broken pieces, we should expect the tension between fact and fiction as both relate to the Middle Passage and its 400 year endurance. I want to go to some of the slides. So here are some of the things 
that again, remembering helps us do. Remembering helps us recall our past. Remembering helps us put it back together or reassemble it. Both undertakings are essential and neither is, is flawless. We have to keep that in mind. We can both remember and remember or put back together imperfectly. Both acts require attention to detail and structure, who, what, when, where, why, and to what extent. Remembering and remembering help us live and function completely in the world. Remembering also invites us to construct and reconstruct our past, present, and future, and thereby regain wholeness and maintain a healthy sense of direction. Remembering and remembering the middle passage required that we understand not only what happened on the journey across the Atlantic, but also what happened on all the shores involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Not yes. Do you want to share your slideshow? Okay, I thought it was shared. I apologize. Me. Thank you for letting me know it wasn't shared. No problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Give me a second, please. Can you see it now? No, not yet. Okay. On the screen, you should be able to clear screen and then hear it. Okay. I'm looking for. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna click through the points that I just made in the interest of time. So these are the, the works that we are going to look at today. The works that I will draw on to examine this ongoing effort to remember, to recall, to remember, that is to restore, are the following. You see Lillian Jones Horace's five, five Generations Hence, and notice that there are two dates there. There's 1916 and 2013. Crowned with Glory and Honor, another of her works. Barry Coon, Toni Morrison's Beloved, Charles Johnson's Middle Passage and Sawande Mustaqim's Slavery at Sea. So this is how the presentation is organized. Part one, I'm gonna talk about Horace and Hurston. In part two, I'll talk about Morrison and Johnson. Part three, uh, Mustaqim, and then I'll make closing remarks about the importance of remembering and remembering, which I think is an ongoing project. project. It's not something we're going to ever be able to stop doing because it's so significant. So let's think about Horace and Hurston. Horace is Texas's and the US South's earliest known African-American female novelist. I'm going to give more de details on her than the others because my presumption is that many people may not know that she exists yet because we just found out that she was there not too many years ago. So she is uh, Texas is in the U.S. South's earliest known African-American female novelist for the modern period. She's the first Black woman nationally to own a publishing company before 1920. Her nearest regional contemporary was Sutton Griggs, an African-American preacher 
uh, newspaper editor and novelist who like she resided in Fort Worth. Her nearest regional female contemporary was Zora Neale Hurston. What's important to note is that both Hurston and Horace, both of their first books focus on Africa. Horace's first book, Five Generations Hence, is a back to Africa novel that predates the Garvey movement of the 1920s. Both her literary solution and Garvey's sociopolitical effort reflected the common presumption that American Blacks were in a better position to lead Africa than were their continental African contemporaries. Joan self-published Five Generations since the same year she graduated valedictorian of Prairie View A&M's class of 1916. In so doing, she wrote and published the first utopian novel by an African-American female writer nationally before 19. 50. Jones Horace's Five Generations Hence makes no reference to the Middle Passage, but rather presumes its occurrence. In the world Jones created, African American women played significant roles as mothers, missionaries, teachers, visionaries, in an international, rather intergenerational transference of hope and, and intent. Visions of Africa were spiritual, a spiritual inheritance and legacy passed down from mother to daughter. For example, missionary Violet Gray, the daughter of a single mother and white father, journeyed to Africa because her mother simply could not go. And Miss Noble, now resigned to helping Africans in Texas, nevertheless hopes her daughters will grow up to emulate missionary Violet Gray and make literal and purposeful trips to the continent of Africa. Visions of Africa were also divinely inspired and confined or interpreted, uh, con confirmed rather, or interpreted by spiritual black women within the community. After Grace Noble shared her dream with missionary Violet Gray, the latter convinced Grace Noble, the main character, that her immediate purpose was to liberate the African-American masses through her writings. Noble felt her own efforts paled when compared to Gray's, but the missionary reassured Grace that everyone had a place and contribution to make with Noble's contribution being her ability to write. Grace Noble eventually shared her dream, making it clear at the outset that the contemporary trials of African-Americans had induced her despair. Noble's dream echoed both Christ's iconic wilderness journey as well as the spiritual journeys to Africa that were prevalent in African-American folklore. Noble's vision fell shy of the imperialist bent that often predominated black male discourse on Africa, but it nonetheless affirmed just how removed Jones the writer and the characters she created were from the continent of Africa, as well as the degree to which the white man's civilization, as she described it, had become the model to which American Blacks and Africans should aspire. And I'm going to show you um, her dream. So again, these are the two works we're looking at. This is from Horace's diary, which I used to um, show you. I wanted to also just show you more of her life, the fact that she was teaching in schools in Texas. She went to Prairie View. Um, she earns her degree at um, Prairie View A&M in 1916. This is a picture of her when she goes back to study library, librarianship. She was also a member of Zeta Phi Beta, and she was a member of the National Association of Colored Women. And this is her five generations since. Notice that she writes Miss Lillian B. Jones. At the time that she wrote Five Generations Hence, she was married to David Jones. And you look at the publication date down here, 1916. This is Dotson Jones, which bears her name, printing company, which she established to publish her work. That's important to keep in mind as we move forward. So this is the dream that Grace Noble has. I saw a people, she said, a black people tilling the soil with a song of real joy on their lips. I saw a civilization like the white man's about us today, but in his place stood another of a different hue. I beheld beautifully paved streets, handsome homes beautified and adorned, and before the doors sported dusky boys and girls. 
I seem to be able to penetrate the very walls of business establishments to see that men and women of color were commercially engaged with one another. This is her dream continues. I was as if I was if thunderstruck a voice when a voice, a small voice, yet seeming to penetrate my inmost soul and cry in th thunderous accents, five generations hence, the title of her book. I was stunned as the truth began to dawn upon my soul. The land was Africa. The people were my own, returned to possess the heritage of their ancestors. I descended the hillside, hope kindled anew in my heaving bosom. Tis no idle tale, I tell you, Violet. I beheld it as I beheld it all as plain as the noonday sun. I have deliberated upon the matter. And do you know, I have become convinced that there will be a final exodus of the Negro to Africa, not a wholesale exodus like the moving of an Indian reservation, but an individual parting, an acquiring of property in that unexplored land and the, and the building of the new nation upon the ruins of the old. Grace Noble's dream highlights the importance of relationship between dreaming and memory in human survival. Dr. Oleg Chernyshev, MD, PhD, Director of Sleep Medicine and Stroke at Louisiana State University, Shreveport, Louisiana, provided me with a brief overview of the relationship between dreaming and memory that I think is instructive. First point he, he made, the, the following factors make us human, cognition, creativity, and consciousness. Dreaming, he stated, is a form of neurocreativity. The brain releases creative energy and helps us adapt and extend our lives. Consciousness and cognition help us remember the result of our behavior, so whether it's successful or unsuccessful, whether, whether we experience maladaptation or adaptation to our environment. Dreaming has two meanings. We have conscious dreaming, as in the speech of Dr. Martin Luther King, I have a dream, and there's unconscious dreaming when we are asleep. Dreaming during sleep helps consolidate our memory. Scientists do not know why, but they do know that when we wake up, when we go to sleep on a problem, we wake up with the answer. And so we have Grace Noble coming up with an answer, her character, with her dream. The process of dreaming or sleeping is also part of a creativity which helps to process information when we are unconscious. When we sleep, our brain cuts out a lot of unnecessary information but retains what's important. When we're dreaming or fantasizing, this is a form of creativity as we control, excuse me, as we can consciously control where it goes. Most importantly, our imagination drives the creativity process with one goal, to attempt to manage, the word is left out, to, to excuse me, to adapt rather to the environment. So here we have Jones the writer trying to grapple with the plight of oppressed black people by creating a character who has a dream that provides a solution. Five generations hence, American Blacks will return to Africa, as she said, not a wholesale parting, but an individual parting. The question that I ask is, did Noble's dream come, come true? I want you to just think for a moment about the African Americans who have gone back to get to Africa. Uh, most recently, I learned that Stevie Wonder uh, was going to um, Ghana. In her work on Lacey Kirk Williams, I'm still with Horace now, which was titled Crowned with Glory and Honor, The Life of Reverend Lacey Kirk Williams. Now she, her name is Horace, she has remarried. Horace, Jones Horace acknowledges the middle passage as fact. Her description juxtaposes the Mayflower and the first ship that landed. Here is her description. These two, history tells of another boat, she said, that landed on the shores of America within the same year, a few leagues down the coast. It does not give us the name of the boat that put into Jamestown in 1619. None of the passengers, so far as I know, 
have been eager to identify themselves with that old slaver that steamed into this Virginia port with 20 black slaves. The air was balmy. The birds sang gaily in the treetops, unmindful of the tragedy being enacted in their wild homes. But one cannot feature much singing, praying, or prayers of thanksgiving by her crew, for this ship had for its unwilling cargo human souls, men, women, and children from whose hearts, from whose hearts the light of hope had gone forever. And she continued. These two ships that cast anchor at Plymouth and Jamestown respectively within that memorable year brought souls that have equally influenced the course of American history. The descendants of the Mayflower have shaped the land, founded a great Republic, made re discoveries and inventions and set up standards of living that are as outstanding as Columbus's voyage. The, the descendants of the old slavers cargo have given their sweat to the to water the soil of America, their blood to maintain her honor and have glorified a part of her artistic and economic splendor. Neither the name of the ship nor any one of its 20 stolen Africans has come down to us. Those wretched creatures bore no names that could be lightly tripped upon the tongue of the sodden slave traders, but they founded a dynasty with all. They formed a problem that led the nation through fire. And their influence is so woven into the achievements and purposes of the United States that like youth or capital or health, they must ever be reckoned with. Horace's juxtaposition and interpretation of events is bold and prescient in its acknowledgement that the destiny of the nation, its achievements and purposes would forever be intricately and inextricably shaped by the influence of black people. Little did Jones Horace know that 76 years later, the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project established in 2011 and the Galveston Historical Society would co-sponsor a ceremony acknowledging the slave trade in Galveston, Texas, just a few days shy of Juneteenth. June 19th, 19, 1985, excuse me, 1865, the date that enslaved, te enslaved Texans learned of their freedom. Thanks to Professor Joan Hubert, I was among the guests who attended the events. Now consider Zora Neale Hurston's Barracoon, which she attempted to get published in 1931. The focus on the Middle Passage and Horace's discussion of the Mayflower and the ship that transported slaves provides excellent segue, an excellent segue into our discussion of Zora Neale Hurston's Barracoon. Like Lillian Jones Horace, Zora Neale Hurston focused on Africa in her first book. It is an anthropological study with a leaving of living, breathing eyewitness, Sola. Horace, uh, excuse me, I just wanted to note that, um, or again, I've mentioned this, that Hurston finished her manuscript in 1931. Notice that it's, it's not published until 87 years after she completed it, okay? So think about how that long period of time impacts what we know, not only what we know, but also what we remember. We can't remember what we don't know anything about. So, uh, we want to think about that as well. And the publication, as I said, was, was released in 2018. And I'll talk more about Deborah Plant and uh, the role that she plays in that. And so here we have the story of Cujo Kuzula Lewis. He was said to be a chief and the oldest slave on the ship. After the war, he and 31 other former slaves founded Africa Town on the north side of Mobile, Alabama. Other continental Africans joined them and formed a community that continued to embrace many of their West African traditions and Yoruba language for decades. A spokesman for the community, Kujo Lewis lived until 1935 and was one of the survivors from the Clotilde. Radoshi, another of the survivors, Another captive on the Clotilda was sold to a planter in Dallas County, Alabama, where she became known as Sally Smith. 
She married, had a daughter, and lived to 1937 in Bogue Chito. She was long thought to have been the last survivor of the Clotilda. Research published in 2020, think about how long we're talking about, right? Indicated that another survivor, Matilda McCreer, lived until 1940. So we see that history is still being, being revealed. So these are facts that we know about the Clotilda. It was the last known US slave ship to bring captives from Africa to the United States. US involvement in the Atlantic slave trade had been banned by Congress through the act prohibiting the importation of slaves enacted on March 2nd, 1807. It was effective in 1808, but the practice continued illegally, especially in New York in the 1950s and early 1860. In the case of the Clotilda, the voyages sponsors, the voyages sponsors were based in the South and planned to buy slaves in Wada Dahomey. After the voyage, the ship was burned and scuttled in Mobile in an attempt to destroy the evidence. But notice that by May 2019, according to um, the Smithsonian Magazine, the, the remains of the Clotilda had been discovered. So imagine that very long period when Herson has attempted to put um, this formerly enslaved African story into the public domain. She cannot find a publisher to do so. Now we want to think about Morrison and Johnson and their memory. Toni Morrison taught first, she taught English first at Texas Southern University uh, from 1955 to 1957. Little did she know at the time that Texas's, even the US South's earliest known African-American female novelist was just 200 miles up the road in Fort Worth, Texas. That this unsung Shiro had authored at least two novels and the definitive biography of an outstanding black Baptist preacher whose approach to Christianity gave rise to the Progressive National Convention, the socially conscious polity with which Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was affiliated. Little did, Horace, did, little did Morrison know that the focus on Africa she later celebrated in Beloved in 1987, 30 years later, had already been initiated by her literary predecessors, Lillian Jones Horace, in 1916 and Zora Neale Hurston in 1931, both of whose works were obscured by structural and behavioral racism, sexism, and regionalism. I wonder to what degree she realized Horace and Hurston, their appreciation for African-American Southern culture and the civil rights movement had paved the way for her and others to work in publishing houses and institutions that denied entry to Horace and Hurston's generation. Morrison's beloved examined slavery and its psychological impact on the enslaved and their descendants. In 1987, Beloved was nominated for the National Book Award. In 1988, it won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. And she noted in the dedication, it was dedicated to 60 million and more, referring to the Africans and their descendants who died as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. And the epitaph reads, as he saith also in OC, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Beloved expresses Morrison's urge to return to the past and seek out gaps in personal memory and cultural history. As Linda Krimholtz notes in The Ghosts of Slavery, historical recovery in Toni Morrison's Beloved. Toni Morrison's Beloved reconceptualizes American history. Most apparent in the novel is its historical perspective. In Beloved, Morrison constructs a parallel between the individual processes of psychological recovery and a history and a, and a historical or national process. And that's important to keep in mind that Morrison, Morrison is attempting to um, celebrate history through Beloved. And again, the content of the novel does not focus on the Middle Passage, but is dedicated 
the memory of those who were in the Atlantic slave trade. It underscores the importance of remembering to wholeness, not only for the characters in the novel, as Krumholtz said, but for reader, for the reader and author as well. And then look, by the time, uh, by we, time, the time we get to October 20, October 12th, 1988, but Beloved received the Frederick G. Melcher Book Award, named for the editor of Publishers Weekly. And Toni Morrison made the following statement during her acceptance speech. She said, there is no suitable memory or, pla or pla plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby honoring the memory of the human beings forced into slavery and brought to the United States. There's no small bench by the road. And because no such a place doesn't exist that I know of, the book had to. So she saw her book as filling a void. Of course, we know that your organization was formed after that. Uh, we also know that the Toni Morrison Society began installing uh, benches um, at significant sites in the history of slavery in America. And then your organization, the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project has taken a very important additional step to help us remember all aspects of the journey. And I, you're, you already know what you do, but I just printed it here for those who may not know that you're a nonprofit tax exempt organization established in 2011 to honor the 2 million captive Africans who perished during the transatlantic crossing known as the Middle Passage and the 10 million who survived to build the Americas. Now let's look at Charles Johnson's work. Charles, uh, Charles Johnson attempted to transcend race through narrative. Johnson's middle passage placed a high value on cultural synthesis. Johnson highlighted the dangers of multiculturalism and expressed the fear that our literature as well as our cultural lives will be balkanized. When compared to Morrison's approach in Beloved, where the consciousness of African-American slaves is valorized, Johnson's middle passage through its many allusions to Western philosophy and creative works placed a high value on cultural synthesis. For some, his call for, multi, for, his call for cultural synthesis seemed to be another form of assimilation in which marginalized, marginalized cultures are ultimately consumed by the dominant culture. For others, Johnson's position seemed to reflect a post-colonial inferiority complex demonstrated when critics and authors of African descent, descent presume European literature and culture to be the universal standard. Although Middle, Middle Passage earned the prestigious National Book Award, the novel was not highlighted in, the profession, in many professional journals or taught in universities or worked into the literary canon in the way that Beloved was immediately after its publication. In addition to its cool reception among literary critics, many women who read Middle Cat Passage claimed that they felt disconnected from the narrative because the novel almost totally excludes female characters. The story to them often felt like a classic male quest narrative, a sea saga in which men are involved in self-conflict as well as battles against each other and against nature. Dr. Kasi? Yes. I'm sorry, it's Regina. I just wanted to let you know we're at the two minute mark. Okay, so we end with Sawade Mustakim. She was clearly fed up with the creative literary approach to the Middle Passage. And, and she noted that her goal was to reclaim the history from literary imagination that has in ways blurred the memories of what really happened on slave ships. The view here, she said, is multifaceted, three-dimensional, historically inclusive, and more than just the theoretical sum of stories and gendered bodies. And she goes on to tell what her book aims to do. One of the things that I was able to pull from Sawade Mustakim was uh, her tweets, something that none of the previous authors could do. But here uh, we notice that she has 3,102 uh, she's following 3,102 and she has 3,294 followers. Um, and here she has this tweet of vindication where she's talking about her work um, where people were not immediately accepted, receptive 
uh, did not necessarily even think she would be successful in graduate school, but she um, succeeds and she's able to, in her, in, uh, according to her estimation, she says this book gives greater attention to the body than ever before in written histories of the middle passage. And she acknowledges the importance of memory. She also, in the spirit of um, Michelle Roth Trujillo, talks about the fact that she is not going to be silent. She, she notices, uh, she says here, my silences uh, are, her silence is denied, excuse me, died all over again. And she says that she's not going to be quiet. So in remembering in general, we wanna keep the following in mind. Uh, Michelle Roth Trujillo says that silences enter into history in four areas, the making of archives, the interpretation of archives, the writing of history and the ma making of history. Getting rid of these silences requires that we constantly manage all aspects of historical production. Doing so will help ensure that we remember and remember history and find wholeness through the careful study of who we are and where we are headed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasi. We're now going to open this up to questions. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions. And, um, or if you are submitting them through Facebook, we'll keep an eye out for them. In the meantime, as we wait for a couple of questions, I have one uh, for you, Dr. Kasi. Can you talk more about how the Middle Passage was much more than an ocean highway, um, but a period used to transform human beings into chattel, psychologically, physically, and spiritually? Well, if we look at Suwade Mustakim's work, which I didn't get to go into, um, she chose to focus on the impact, um, the horrific impact that the journey had on women and children, um, that they were vulnerable to, uh, they were already being exploited as slaves, but they were subjected to sexual exploitation as well, women were. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the there's been a lot of discussion about the different, um, the, the kind of cultural melding that's happening, happening in that these people who are on the ships are from all over um, the, you know, the Central Africa and they are speaking different languages and uh, trying to grapple with the fact that they are going to a place that they don't even know anything about or understand. Um, I think her work would be a good one to uh, look at to, to know just how horrific that journey was. Absolutely. Another question is, why do you think Lillian Jones Harris isn't better known given her accomplishments? She, I think part of her problem was that she was not part of one of the writing communities that was eventually studied. Like the, those, the writers that we associate with the Harlem Renaissance, those that we associate with the Chicago Renaissance. She went to both places, but she was centered primarily in Texas. She also self-published her work, which meant that it would not have been, if it was not with a major publisher, um, and it ha this happens with a lot of writing by Black writers, if it's self-published and it's not, and it doesn't become part of the mainstream, then it kind of falls off the radar until somebody finds it. And this is where archiving becomes really important. Um, so that if these books are uh, uh, like Lillian Horace's works, they were in an archive that was started by a black woman in Fort Worth and eventually um, they ended up at the Fort Worth Public Library where I was able to look at them. So I think it was her regional location. And I also think it was that she was spending a lot of her time teaching in public schools uh, as opposed to teaching in university settings mm -hmm. where you might've seen um, Zora Neale Hurston uh, W.B. Du Bois and, and some of the, early, the earlier Black scholars. Well, I think this is a perfect seg segue to um, the next question. Could you say something about Hurston not being able to find a publisher? Was it because her work was too much of a truth that people were not ready for? Well, 
the publishers weren't interested. I think we can only speculate. And I think, I think that um, it was the part of the problem was that, think about it, this uh, last slave ship was in 1860. And so she's publishing, uh, trying to publish this in 1930. The United States at that point had affirmed uh, through Plessy versus Ferguson separate but equal, which is of course never equal. And so the United States as a nation was not ready to deal with um, inequality and, and all of the ramifications associated with enslavement. So I think that's probably the reason it was just so close to, mm -hmm. it was too close for comfort. Um, and, and you can also think about just how this delayed knowledge of her book, apart from scholars who might have known about it, the fact that it wasn't there for the public to appreciate, it delays the importance of, it delays the opportunity to even know and remember. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all part of that, that general effort to make people forget or to sweep things under the cover and act like they don't, uh, they didn't happen at all. And this is why uh, archivy is important. It's, it's why what you're doing as an organization is important. Great. Um, another question is, can you elaborate on transcending to heal versus reclaim and heal? Transcending to heal and reclaim. Okay, so reclaiming, reclaiming to heal is, is that idea is rooted in the idea that you are going, you are deliberately going back to the past and you are using what you, you are facing what you confront and you are trying to make sense of it. And through that process, you are healing. Um, the, the idea of transcendence and what I think Johnson was attempting to do is to say, well, we know what happened. Uh, we, we've, so now it's time to move past what happened, right? And so I think one says we need to visit with it and know what happened. The other says, okay, it happened, let's move on. But the problem is, you know, when you're still discovering uh, the Clotilda, you know, right. <laughs> <in 2019, laughs> when things keep popping up, right? Um, exactly. You're having to continue to go back and remember and, and digest. I see this in my students a lot. When they have not been exposed to African-American history, when they go through a kind of grieving process, right? Where first of all, what? They can't believe it. They can't believe this happened. And then they'll sometimes you know, become angry. Well, I can't believe this happened. Um, and they, they have to work through these emotional stages. It's almost like a kind of experience with grief. And mm -hmm. then after they've accepted it, they're like, oh, wow, I'm so glad I now know this and I can share it with, with other people. And so again, when these, um, these bones, we keep finding these bones and we keep finding these other things, uh, they, they keep throwing us into uh, this important space where we acknowledge what happened in the past and we deal with it. Great, um, we have another question. What do you think of those who criticize Barracoon saying that Hurston injected too much of herself into Cujo's narrative? I think I, I think that's probably overstatement. Um, I you know one of the things that people who do research find, in fact, there's a there's a whole um, uh, area of research, a methodological approach that allows you to do that anyway. Uh, autoethnography. It's kind of hard. I, I know I've experienced this even as a scholar myself. I might be somewhere trying to do Black history, but at the same time, I'm being acted upon as a person who happens to be. African American. So while I'm trying to write down details, I'm also dealing with my own issues. Um, so I'm trying to be objective, but I'm being thrown into the story anyway. So <laughs> there, uh, I think that may be uh, an unfair assessment uh, that she's injecting herself too much because certainly we do see, we definitely see uh, um, Casola and we definitely see his story uh, mm -hmm. in a way that we would not have seen without what she produced. Another question we have is uh, any idea why it took 160 years to find or validate that the Clotilda existed? It, first of all, the, the trade was illegal, right? At that point, at that point. Mm -hmm. So part of it is to hide what was, what was actually happening. And the other part is, is again to conceal, I think it's related to concealing this knowledge 
so that um, people can't react to it, right? You can't react to what you don't know about. Um, and so it, it's, it's funny that now it's found. Uh, I think that somebody always knew, knew where it was, uh, but, but time, uh, you know, leave, allowing for this time to, to move past kind of takes us away from the immediacy of the moment. Mm -hmm. It's kind of controlled, uh, a controlled release of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It makes it hard to aggregate all of it too. Well, it does, yeah. it does. And this is why it's so important, again, to just realize that if you're going to preserve history, it has to be an ongoing structured effort because, there's, because there's, there are all these multiple perspectives um, related to whatever the historical event is. And some people want to forget and others want to remember. Mm -hmm. and those who want to remember have to take responsibility to uh, make sure that, that certain things are never forgotten. Thank you. Um, we have time, I believe, for another question. Do you know whether these topics were discussion items at Fisk University's Race Relations Institute established by Charles S. Johnson in the 40s? I'm sorry? Uh, do you know whether these topics were discussion items at Fisk University's Race Relations Institute, which was established by Charles S. Johnson in the 40s? No, I, I'm not familiar with that. You can please tell me more. Okay, what we'll do is um, follow up with the writer, uh, the person who asked this answer, to, sorry, ask the question and share some answers with her. Thank you. Um, one last one. Hello from Glasgow, really fascinating talk and introduction to Lillian Jones Horace. Where do you think she found her inspiration for her utopian writing? I think she, uh, that's a very good question. She always wanted to write. Uh, number one, she talked, she said in her diary that she wanted more than any tangible thing to write a book worth the reading by an intelligent person. And she added, not necessarily my friend. She was um, a voracious reader as a child. She was always interested in literature and she always wanted to write. Uh, I think that she would, would, would also, given that she studied at Bishop College and also at Prairie View a and she would have been introduced to people like W.E.B. W. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, uh, you know, the, the quote, Negro uh, literati and all of those people, she would have known about them and um, just followed her natural inclination to want to write. In fact, she is credited with a stamp establishing drama uh, in uh, the Fort Worth area. So she was just committed. It was something that she naturally wanted to do. She was an English teacher. She served as a journalist. She served as an editor for the Eastern Star. Uh, she was a member of Heroine of Jericho. So I think uh, that in addition to all of the, the, the life around her that she felt needed to be described and grappled with all of that was inspiration in and of itself for her. I'm sure it was. Uh, this will be our last question. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kasi. My question is, where is your personal history in this middle passage narration? Which I think is a great question to end this um, segment. Oh, wow. <laughs> you would ask me that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you have less than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. You know, it's funny. I started to put a slide here with my uh, genetic profile from Ancestry.com. And in the name of not inserting myself in the story, <laughs> I, didn't include that. I didn't include that that slide. But I will say that um, I'm not sure what you're seeing on your screen at this point. Um, we're seeing you with your background. Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay, because I saw some other stuff and I was like, okay. Um, I, uh, one thing I'll say, I'll say, I'll say this. One thing that uh, doing the, the, the DNA test made me really appreciate was um, the ability to just know from which parts of the world, um, you know, uh, the, the parts of the world that I'm connected to. Uh, and it was just fas fascinating to see, you know, Nigeria and mm. Ghana and, you know, it's like having this 
acknowledgement. And then also seeing the European strands that were there mm. um, that were surprising, Native American, and all of that just, uh, I thought about, of course, I just was forced into thinking and welcome thinking about all the different cultures that are represented in, in all of us. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge and celebrate, uh, learn as much as we can about who we are, mm -hmm. because really we're interconnected whether we want to be or not. Uh, and I think when we, when we approach who we are and try at least to think about doing things in a way that um, move mankind forward, we're all better, better off. So I think that I'm, I, I'm in the middle of, just as we all are, I believe, when we think about the 400 years, right? It's gonna take at least another 400 to, to pull all of this together. Um, but I think along the way, we can always continue to look for the fruitful things. We, can, we have to discard certain things, but um, move forward in a way that's progressive and that in a way that promotes harmony um, and appreciation for all people. Absolutely, that's that's a perfect ending to this segment. And I know we still have questions in the queue, but unfortunately we will not be able to get to them in this particular session, but please feel free to send an email with your unanswered question to middlepassagemarkers at gmail.com and we will respond. Well, thank this you very much. much. Oh, thank you so much. This brings us to the end of our Black History Month Middle Passage speaker series entitled Voyage Through Death to Life Upon These Shores. The Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project thanks all of you for joining us today and every Monday during this month. Your interest and support have been essential to our work to honor African ancestors. We also wanna thank the board and thanks again to all those who have donated to and volunteered with the um, project. Your donations and your time are the reasons that we can do and have programs like this. I wanna give a special shout out to Nick Huster for his expertise in putting together this program and in the entire series. Um, uh, we also wanna thank us especially our moderator, Michelle Dingle, who has wonderfully hosted all but today's presentations. I definitely had big shoes to fill. We also thank our esteemed speakers who have participated in the series. Dr. David Ellis, Dr. Jason Obi, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, and of course, Dr. Kasi Chernyshev, who shared their time and knowledge with us in helping us to understand Middle Passage history a documented history of African presence and contributions of 495 years, beginning at Sapelo Bay, Georgia in 1526, which is 93 years earlier than the 1619 arrival of Africans to Virginia. Your words have served as inspiration that will inspire and empower us today and for generations to come. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful day. Bye.